big role here except to, to welcome you to Lawrence Technological University. I know the provost did that earlier today, uh, but I'm doing it as well uh, from the point of view of the College of Architecture and Design. Um, we really feel like, uh, like this should be the sustainability home in the region. And feel, I want you to feel like this is your home to engage the issue of sustainability whenever you feel like it. Uh, we have a few people here, Janice Means, uh, uh, Bills of Walters, and others, that, that it's not only their sustainability home, it's their home <laughs> in general. And so, so just um, uh, you know, keep us in mind when you have uh, uh, when you have suggestions, when you have insights. If you want to bring your enthusiasm here about the subject, if you want to come hear our speakers, uh, because we have frequent lectures on uh, sustainability issues, we have courses, we have all kinds of things uh, in which you can engage us and um, and do consider us home sweet home. Uh, with that said, uh, welcome again uh, to the conference and to Lawrence Tech. Our seventh. And I would, uh, to introduce the keynote speaker, I'd like to call on Professor Janice Means. Hello again. I feel like I've been up in front of you so much this today. But it's my honor now to introduce Doug Farr. And I have to tell you a story. When <laughs> When Doug was a student, he, Doug's about 10 years younger than me. When he was a student back, it was the late 70s, early 80s, uh, I was on the board of directors in the Michigan Solar Energy Association, and I, I've driven vans since the 70s, and I thought, well, I'll get a group to go to, to one of the passive solar conferences, and I think it was one of the first. I don't remember which one. But Doug was one that, and I remember, can I share it? I picked I him up on the expressway and he said where do you want me to meet you and he said well just pull off right here and, and that's how we did it right to, <laughs> i not don't remember it, i don't remember <laughs> picked him up to, to go yeah. in any case uh doug is the founding principal of the architecture and urban design firm called far associates doug actually is originally from uh this area you were born in detroit weren't you doug cast tech and you went to Cast yeah. Tech, so it's, this is really his original home. I was so born welcome in him Cast back. Tech, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he, he now has his home in Chicago, and he just shared with me that he just uh, recently had his seventh lead platinum. Do you catch this lead platinum mm -hmm. building, uh, and the second net zero energy building? So yeah. yeah. that say that there's no such thing as a net energy building. So here we go. There you go. <laughs> Some of you, I know that there are a lot of USGBC people out there, and you know that uh, he was one of the, or not one of, he was the, the, actually the original chair, right, for the Neighborhood Development Lead ND. And uh, I could say so many wonderful things about Doug, but Don't. I'm going to let him come up and, to, and I know you want to hear him rather than me, so give a warm welcome to Doug Farr. So the driver always remembers the ride more than the rider, apparently. I don't remember this idea of getting picked up on the expressway. It probably happened, you know. It, if you remember the 70s, you weren't there, you know, that sort of thing. Yes. So is it possible to dial down the lights? I just have that, you know, feeling. I know there's a risk after lunch of, you know, people nodding out. But um, trust me, I will make, I believe I will make it interesting. So thank you all for coming. Thanks for the gracious uh, introduction and welcome. Um, what I want to talk today about, and many of you have, you know, been subjected to my rants in the past. And so I oftentimes talk a lot talk about lead neighborhood or things like that, and I've given that talk in this room or one down the hall a few times, so I'm not gonna give that one. So what interests me, what I wanna to talk to you about today, and I think will be of interest to you, is just the journey to get to kind of what, what we're about, this idea of sustainable urbanism and the integration of place, infrastructure, and buildings. And so I went to architecture school twice. Who's an architect in the room? Anybody an architect or an architecture student? And engineers? All right, there's two of you, thank you for coming. Uh, landscape architects, planners, mayors, any elected officials, anything like that? Okay, so good, a good group, very good. So anyway, but how is it that you end up, or I ended up, 
having this interest and this practice that sort of sits betwixt and between a lot of things. And, um, and, it, and that, that's the story I want to tell you. And, and also to, um, to share this idea that all the kind of the outputs of, of all this stuff, like Lead Neighborhood or any of the writing systems, are reductions. They're like simplifications. They're not as rich as it is, right? I think of this as really kind of a way of thinking and a way of operating. And you try and take a snapshot and capture and say, well, what, what about it can we measure? And it gets simpler than it really is. So anyway, so with, with that sort of set up, you know, here we go. I think that um, you know, this is old news to everybody here, but sustainability, everything we do as people, we start from some corner of it. We rarely are able to grasp the entirety of our lives or our family or our career, any of those sorts of things. And when it comes to sustainability, of course, we start with some corner of it, right? If we're an architect, we see it through buildings. If we're planners, we see it through land use. If we're uh, you know, engineers, we see it through the systems of, of a building or, or of a city. And it's very hard to overcome. This is the default setting. In fact, there's lots, lots of you know, anthropology that is about we really do well in silos, that we, our, our kinship, our family networks reinforce the values of you're a good engineer, and I hang out with other engineers so they can tell me that, right? If you hang out with architects and other people, they have no idea what kind of engineer. You don't get any strokes. You're just the oddball. So really, we are wired to have kinship networks and to hang out in silos. So anyway, with that set up. So the other thing to say, these are just framing, framing images to start. So the idea that efficiency is somehow in the mix on sustainability, and it is. I mean, efficiency is awfully important. Um, and you know you apply it at different scales: the light bulb, the Prius, the the, the green building. Um, now the uh, uh, Boeing Dreamliner. I don't know if you watch those, watch the press releases as it's come out. It's a new a new type of airliner that's made out of carbon fiber. It's lighter. It's more fuel efficient. And you think, oh, that's cool. You know, airline fleets will save 15 percent on fuel. They'll just use that much less fuel. No, no, no. They're identifying new routes that, that require longer distances to fly. So the, fl the plane can now to fly direct Chicago to Kuala Lumpur when it couldn't before. And the technology enables more miles, not fewer. And so that's an oddity. It's called Jevons paradox. The more efficient things become, the more, more of them we consume. Right? So efficiency alone won't get us there. We are naturally attuned to work in silos and kinship networks where people know who we are and know our status. So, so then LEAD. And who's a GBC member? A few of you. Thank you. Wonderful. So LEAD you know, started, um, USGBC started in 1993. The term LEAD was coined in 1996. And early on had four of these five. And then eventually in 98, 99 codified it five, these five categories well known to you now in LEAD NC and, and many of the other rating systems. And it was written by a group of people from basically suburban Washington and their friends who flew in from around the country to address a fairly, they had a, a mental image in their mind of the building that LEAD was meant to improve on. And it was a suburban commercial uh, building, you know, typically a standalone office building or commercial building on a larger lot that was much larger than the building needed. So there was often kind of residual landscape or wood lots and so on. And they designed the lead to do a better job at that. And so, and then it went off viral and took over the world and it had all the quirks of it's the localness and the uniqueness of where it was thought of and what problem it was conceived to solve. And so, to this day, I can point you to the parts of the that take me to suburban Virginia, right? So it's, it's kind of interesting. And the idea, uh, you know, actually a quote from Rick Fenerizzi, who's head of the USC from now five years ago. Hey, even I know if every building in the world were platinum, we'd still have a ton of work to do. We would not have solved the world's problems, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll, you know, you see an example like this. This is perped out. The client is virtuous. The building is wonderful. You know, it sips energy, it sips water. If you're hungry, you can eat the walls, right? So it's a great example of a green building. But look at its context. The building has no, nothing to say. Context, it was not. This is a platinum, so the score that Lee gives it was not dinged by being basically surrounded by paving and parking lots. And so you can see, like, if the world were a series of platinum buildings in islands, we made some progress on energy and water and all the things that it targeted, but we've still got a, total, you know, a ton of work to do. And so, 
and you get these funny anomalies. And this is back to sort of silos. And you know, lead is a silo. And you know, I give this talk not to scold or discourage. Quite the contrary, is to have a kind of higher vision of what, what we're about, that those tools are important. They motivate people to do better. At the same time, they won't necessarily remind you, shake you up, and say, think at the bigger scale. And so maybe if there's one take home today, that's it. So here's an example. We had, uh, in 2007, we had enough money to hire an intern that didn't have to work on a project. Remember those days? They were just great. And uh, we set, uh, Will Drucker was his name, and we set him out and said, Look at the USGBC website, find 10 green schools, you know, lead certified schools around the country, it's a random sample, tell me, what, tell me what they're about. And I suspected something like this. So three of the 10 fit this mold. So the, there was an existing school in this town of West Brazos, Texas, and it was where A shows, right? And what happened was the uh, city decided to make a new green school. And you know, the old school was in the little downtown. It was one of those classic walk to elementary schools on a city block, no parking lot. Students and teachers walked to work. I mean, it was kind of the dream, the American dream of that kind of cute neighborhood, uh, you know, uh, Mayberry RFD, you know, Andy and Opie, the whole thing, Aunt B, uh, whatever your age, you know, there's I'm sure newer updates to all that. Where do they build the school? Three miles out of town on a highway, right? And the new, the old school that didn't have a parking lot and you know was walked to and everything, arguably the model, the very model of sustainability, was not LEED certified. But the new one out on the highway was. And so, where does the sustainable plaque go? The new school with the big parking lot. And one of the virtues, one of the kind of uh, press claims of this new school was how virtuous they were for filtering, capturing and filtering the rainwater that flowed from the parking lot that the school in the wrong location suddenly needed, right? And so you can see like, okay, it got a plat, but are we better off? No, we're worse off, but it's LEED certified. So, you know, there, that cognitive dissonance I want it to frame. So when you see LEED certified, thumbs up, they did something good, but it doesn't mean that they didn't also inadvertently overlook some stuff. And you look at a picture like this, this is not lead platinum, it's you know, stress on the question mark there, but it is the simple idea that could this be lead certified? Absolutely. Could it be platinum? Absolutely. And what, would, you know, what questions would lead ask of it? Is there you know, lead absurd? Like, is this absurd? You know, it is absurd, right? So, but lead doesn't ask that question. Lead would ask, you know, is the, are the um, escalators efficient? <laughs> Um, is the stainless, you know, virgin or recycled, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, you can take apart an absurd picture into its components and rate the components and find them really lovely, right? And then the whole thing was a step backwards. So anyway, lead, you know, apply the tool. It is a virtuous tool. As Janice says, we're very proud of our clients, uh, the most recent of which we just got our seventh platinum. That's really, I'm terribly proud of all that. So. Uh, don't go away and say, oh, he hates lead. No, I live, eat, and breathe lead. But, you know, like, you love it, and you have to be critical of it. So, so anyway, Far Associates. So we're in Chicago. We're, you know, a little kind of boutique outfit. You know, plus or minus 15 people in the bad times less and the good times more, something like that. But here's our sort of motto. Implementing sustainable urbanism from room to region where every increment of architecture and planning aspires to perfect the city. So that's our scale. That's, it's the city. It's not the building. It's not the light bulb. It's not the Prius. It's the city. So that's kind of where, where we're thinking. And where does this come from? Has anybody here read a book by Malcolm Gladwell at all? Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah. Tipping point, you know, da da da. The one I'm referring to here is called Outliers. And the, the title doesn't appear here. But if you've read Outliers, the premise is simple, which is, there are people that develop expertise in different areas, and he looked at all these different groups and found this commonality, that they had spent 10,000 hours applying their being, their practice, their work, whatever, to that task. And you know, the examples he cites are very flattering that I would think that I was you know, on par with any of these people. The Beatles. So the Beatles apparently played the same bar in Hamburg for like six or seven years, five sets a night, right? 10,000 hours. And they would do, they, could, they learned their instruments, they could sing, they could sing in harmony, they could finish each other's musical sentences, blah, 10,000 hours. Bill Gates. As a 14-year-old, he attended the only school in North America that had apparently a 
direct connection to a mainframe computer. And he started writing computer code at age 14. By the time he was 19 or 20 and 21 and dropped out of Harvard, 10,000 hours of writing computer code. So it's this idea of immersion over a long period of time. I don't know that the magic number is 10,000, but it was a good hook for Malcolm Gladwell's book. So this is, um, this is our little sort of timeline of Farr Associates. And just the only explanation you need is to know that these are pictures of real projects. And above the line is architecture, and below the line is planning. And we just pulled this together for uh, an awards or submission we're doing. What it, the message, I would say, is that so often innovations, I think, happen at the intersection of different things, right? Where so-and-so touches so-and-so. Steve Jobs always said Apple's innovation was it was technology meets art, right? The what you see is what you get on the screen, the graphic, very high graphic quality and industrial design quality of the products. Okay. Technology meets art. In this case, you know, as a practice, we've always been halvesies, architecture and planning, right? And it's not like planning took off and we dropped architecture. No, we kept them both. And as one grew, the other grew. So it was like, there aren't a lot of people that fit this profile. There aren't a lot of firms that fit this profile. Maybe yours does, or maybe you would like it to. Looking back, we didn't know this at the time, but looking back, damn it, we were, you know, have halvesies the whole time. And so across, and we were a little office. And so every, there were no private offices. Everybody's business was everybody's business. And so an idea from a building could be applied to a city. An idea from a city could be applied to a building, et cetera, et cetera. And so therein lies the seeds for me of sustainable urbanism, right? How have we have been doing it? We've been doing it 10,000 hours. We've been straddling these different scales and applying innovations, which always start at the small end. You know, I'll just say to the planners, thank you for coming, and here's a, some good news. So the uh, AIA Committee on the Environment, which was the first moment when that professional organization said, we're interested in environmental things, was, was created three years before the Rio Earth Summit in 1990. Rio Earth Summit was 93. Last week, the American Planning Association, for the first time, created a sustainability, whatever it's called, the practice area, whatever it's called, 22, year, 22 years after the architects, right? Now, it's not that planners don't read the papers or aren't committed to all this stuff. It came to architecture quicker because a building gets a bill for everything it uses. There's an energy bill. There's a gas bill. There's an electric bill. There's a sewer bill. There's a water bill. There's a telephone bill. Everything is quantified, and you're charged for it. And it creates an instant market, an instant incentive to do better at anything you're measured, measured on and billed for. Planning struggles. There, isn't, there is no such bill sent to a neighborhood. You're, dri you're all collectively driving too much. You owe more this month, right? And there isn't that sort of same armature, that framework that automatically kicked the architects into, into action years later. And you'll see trying to apply the lessons of buildings to planning you know, has its limits, but I think there, there are some lessons. So I'm gonna take you through a few kind of projects of ours that, that were formative. So this was, if I go back one, the first planning project, you can see we were just little you know, remodelings and kitchens and bathrooms like every other startup architecture firm. And then in 1993, we got this project, Community Green Line Initiative. It completely fell in our lap. It wasn't really a project we got paid we're supposed to get paid $4,000, we paid $2,000. So it was one of those kind of startups you would never put up with it today, whatever. But it was planning a 10 mile swath of Chicago, from Chicago to Oak Park, is connected by what was then called the Lake Street L, is, you know, 15 years ago was renamed the CTA Green Line. But it's an elevated, you know, Chicago style train, there it is, uh, with the tracks removed during repair that connected those two things. Built in 1892, it was 100 years old at the time, 101, and what had all these slow zones. Why? The metal had rusted, nobody had spent a dime on it, and this train would go along sometimes as slow as five miles an hour, and it was the engineer's response saying, we don't think it's safe, but if you go slower, it's probably better, right? <laughs> and so, uh, so then CTA said, well, you know what? It's kind of broke, and we don't have money, so we're gonna actually just torch it and take it down. And this was you know, a spine of transit that served this community, however imperfectly, at five miles an hour, that connected Oak Park. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright rode this train. Louis Sullivan rode this train. I mean, this has you know, legacy and, uh, dare I say, Ernest Hemingway probably rode this train because he lived in Oak Park and so on. I mean, there's lot, lots of you know, generations of human beings 
relied on this bit of infrastructure. And so we got involved with a friend at the Center for Neighborhood Technology to come up with this thing, this new thing called TOD, Transit Oriented Development, right? Which we now know is you put a dot where the station is and you draw a you know half mile circle around it and you say it's a TOD, right? So the drawing we did there was exactly that, dots and dots and circles. And we had bought Peter Calthorpe's book like the month before, and we were not sharing with anybody else the fact that we had Peter Calthorpe's book. And we say, well, how do you do that? Say, let me just check, excuse me. <laughs> okay, well, here's how you do that. So we were completely stealing, you know, and great, you know, the good architects borrow, great architects steal. I don't know that we're great architects, but stealing is an honored tradition. Please do it. Steal from everything I've given you today and everything you take with you. So, but so in 93, there we were, you can, almost can't tell it, but there's kind of a colored circle and then kind of black and white edge. And this is, you know, colored pencil, remember those things? We used to do that. But mm -hmm. what this did at the time was introduce a little architecture firm to the idea of land use. The graphics were terrible. Look at this, look, barely legible, right? But it worked for a couple things. One is it worked for us to identify this idea that around a train station, there's an opportunity to create an optimized community. Like, what are the elements of daily life? What are, what are my kind of go-to needs on a daily basis? And listed them out, right? Not perfect, but damn close. You know, 20 years later, it's pretty good. You need a bank, you need a daycare center, you need a variety of housing types, you need a grocery store, you need a post office. I mean, this is, this is hardly, you know, hardly, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a, innovative today. But at the time, it was a, a total eye-opener. It was just great. The second thing it was successful at was we made a plan, it went into a booklet, and the community activists would take this plan and roll it up and shake it at people at the meetings. Like, we have a plan to redevelop our community based on, geez, based, sorry about that. I don't know what that was. Like a, Power planning. Power planning, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a plan to redevelop our community. You can't take this line down, you have to fix it. And that was politically successful, and the CTA found 350 million bucks to fix this thing. And suddenly we were the experts, right? Remember, I'm looking at the book over here. But we're the experts, and so we were getting hired for, that, that launched the whole thing. Meanwhile, we're still architects, right? And we're, you know, like Janice said, in the 70s and the 80s, that was kind of my obsession with solar, and then it was, you know, energy efficient, and then it was healthy, and then unhealthy buildings, you know, they were kind of a meandering path to get there. But in our architecture, we were playing with this idea of that roofs should slope somehow to face the sun. So here was a little project we did. We faced these tilty roofs to the south. It was 1990, what is it, 96 was when it was done. But in the early 90s, we weren't sure what actually to mount on it, but we had this instinct that you should have a surface facing south. So we got that built, right? But we didn't really know. Then we did this, this is actually a solar, passive solar house. This is the south face, and we tilted the roof the opposite way. Why? To make the south elevation taller, to have more kind of uh, absorption, which is what we're trained to do. Overhangs and so on. Uh, you know, a super insulated house, geothermal, da 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 da. But we are me messing with the roof the exact opposite move from what we did like the year before in the other project, right? Actually, those, these are the same year. So we're, we're, we don't know what we're doing. We're tilting the roof this way to collect things. We're tilting the roof this way to do passive solar. So hold those two settings. And then we get this project uh, a little later to put a garden on top of a building. This is the first time we got hired. An existing building, we you know, cleaned up the facade and so on. But it was putting a garden on the building. So we're messing with roof angles, putting gardens on buildings, 1998. We don't, can't really tell that this is part of any particular path or plan. We did a lot of historic renovations then, and we worked really hard at admitting daylight into the center. So this is that, uh, it was a historic Elks building. Here's the ballroom, uh, a kind of architectural insertion we did, sky lit, top lit, you know. And so this idea that deep, bulky buildings, uh, we were reading about daylight. And this is, you know, whatever year it was, 90, I guess there wasn't a year on it, but it was, I think, 98 or 99 pre-lead, but reading about daylighting and how you can get more uh, efficient light naturally with less heat than with artificial light. So we're interested in all these things, right? So that was the architecture run. So now we're back to planning. Remember, we're now national experts on TOD because we had Peter Calthorpe's book before anybody else did. So we're getting hired for stuff. So here's one, neighborhood, you know, neighborhood redevelopment, 1996, infill redevelopment. Here's another one, Washington Park on the south side, 1996. Here's a TOD, Transit Oriented Development, 
out, you know, out metropolitan St. Louis. So now we're not just, you know, in our little town. We're going to the next town uh, and trying that out. Richmond, California, 1998. So we're hired on the West <coughs> Coast, which is where they kind of hooked up TUD in the first place. We're apparently expert enough. We're getting hired in California. Like, wow, how did that happen? But we're still, you know, six people or seven people. And we've got architecture and planning all going on. And that same year, 1998, we came back and revisited the Lake and Pulaski, our first TOD plan. So there's the L in the foreground. This is Pulaski Street, and Lake uh, runs under the train as, as it does you know, in the picture I showed you and in the movie, The French Connection. If you remember that one where they're racing between the pillars and they're going to hit something that's so scary. Right? Same deal. So we, here we sort of came back a few years later and did a plan for that station. So it's you know U-shaped circle of buildings around a park. Part of this is you know, fairly optimized TOD. The supermarket is at the top of the park there. Its parking field is to the left, so it's got teaser parking and you know, kind of suburban uh, amounts of parking, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're still using color pencils in you know, kind of pretty drab colors. But, but so we're cooking on the planning. We're figuring out place making, and we're toying with how the buildings ought to be greener or daylit or solar powered or something like that. Lead happens. 1998 was the Green Building Challenge, 1999 was LEED 1.0, and it came into my inbox. There was an email in 1999, for those of you who were so young, wondered, you know, would there have been email? There was. And LEED came into my inbox, and we used it. And so I would happen to be chair of the AIA Committee on the Environment for Chicago, and I got this thing, and I said, we need Chicago, the city, to be our client. And right in the middle of that, Mayor Daley had gone to Germany, come back, and put a green roof, vegetated roof, on our city hall. And he was saying, this is the top of my environmental agenda. And we all scratch our heads like, please don't say that. Because, you know, a green roof is like number 90 out of 100 for me. Like, it, it's important, but there's a, a lot of things to do well before that. So anyway, we trotted over to city hall, got hooked up with a good commissioner, and they commissioned this project, the Chicago Center for Green Technology. And I was asked to organize all my friends who had been on the Committee on the Environment through the 1990s arguing with me about what a green building was to be our team. And so we did this. And Bar Associates was the architect of record. World's third platinum building, um, our first, world's third. And the first platinum building that had public transit. And when we figured that out, that like weirded me out. Like, wow, you can have a platinum building that you drive to all the time? That's kind of funny. Seemed like, you know, now I see this kind of a silo or a, you know, a clan, you know, anthropological thing like that, which wasn't part of the core values of that group that wrote that and administered that. But I'm a little bit an outsider and an insider, so seen it both ways. And Chicago Center, you know, excuse me, a couple things. So, you know, the rooftop is, it's an existing building from 1952. The rooftop gets filled with photovoltaics. On the right, that sort of dark patch is a vegetated roof, the city's second vegetated roof, and the only one that's publicly accessible. Um, and then we're learning stuff about how stormwater works with, uh, uh, with uh, you know, naturalized uh, habitat and hydrology. In this case, we put the geothermal system underneath the, um, the drainage field because saturated soil is more efficient than dry soil. So there was kind of a sweet spot. Those two things seem to uh, function together. We uh, installed um, you know, the city's first cistern on the left. You know, Chicago, like Michigan, is blessed with you know, the Great Lakes and 20% of the world's fresh water supply. What's with the cistern, buddy? Like, we, have a, we don't even have to think about it. We don't even sometimes have to meter it. In fact, Chicago's still installing meters for the first time uh, you know, now. So it's kind of a little crazy. So way out ahead, we had to import the cistern from Texas. It came on a truck from Texas, where they don't have as much water. So, and you can see building integrated photovoltaics, rooftop photovoltaics. So here's our geothermal system getting uh, uh, inserted, installed, whatever, in the winter. Um, you know, the thing on the right, the joke I like to make is when I grew up, that was a ditch. But, you know, in 1999, it became a bioswale. <laughs> and, uh, and there is a difference. I mean, my, it's a joke to, you know, get people over it. But the bioswale, the difference is you see how the stones are used to block the flow of water. And that's to allow it to actually dam and back up so that there is more standing water with more surface area at the bottom of it so there's greater infiltration. We don't want water to flow through bioswale the way we do a ditch. So I make the joke and then immediately take it back. So don't tell that joke. It's not true. It's not true. So Chicago Center for Green Technology also, first time where we said, where the hell did these building components come from? Where are they made? How far are they trucked? Are they 
you know, are they brought here on bicycle or rickshaw or you know, uh, whatever in a you know, red flyer wagon? What is it? No, you know, they're trucked oftentimes from very long distances. And so this, to me, is a huge economic development opportunity, which is to say, if your buildings, as they once were, were sourced locally, there's a huge, you know, bump up for your economy. So. Having done buildings, planning, buildings, planning, and have this and leads now in the mix, we had our aha moment. So in 1999, we took the things we had learned at Chicago Center, the five lead principles, and said, couldn't we just apply them to a plan, a planning scale master plan? And so we did that in this project called For Normal Illinois. And it's a, it was a classic downtown master plan. Here's the Amtrak line from St. Louis to Chicago. Five streets come together, we resolved it in a circle. And we didn't know enough to know that you couldn't do any of those things. The other thing is we wanted to catch all the rainwater off the streets and make them into a sort of public uh, display, cleanse them and have people sort of play with them, touch them, uh, enjoy the water, right? So kind of messing with public and private land and the role of infrastructure, public and private, we just didn't know. We just thought it was all good ideas. Um, here we went, so that was our first, you know, aha project. Our second one was go back, going back and re-rendering the Lake and Pulaski thing I showed you a couple minutes ago, one year later. And you can see the influence of Chicago Center. Suddenly all the buildings have green roofs, photovoltaics, solar panels. The park is now, we thought, as a stormwater park. We're going to catch all the water off the streets and put it in the park. We're going to put a geothermal field under that park, just we, the way we did at CCGT. And none of these buildings need, even need to have mechanical systems, so just have a common one under, under the park. Uh, and you know, dozens and dozens of other activities, but this was the moment at which there was the, this is the picture, I look back, it's like, this was it. Like we finally had you know, blended you know, Steve Jobs with technology and art. In this case, it was sort of green building principles and urban scale. That was the kind of Venn diagram overlap. Then we, you know, we're, we're really excited. So we're just doing this on all, all our planning projects. Our rendering style changes, and now includes, you know, there it is, photovoltaic, green roof, it's every planning project, 1999. That's kind of what we knew to do. And we turned this one in, and our client was the Regional Transit Authority, the Metropolitan Transit Agency, and they said, planning's great, just love it. You know, love the streets and everything. But, you know, that green stuff, we didn't ask for that. And it's confusing to us and we don't know what to do with it. And so can you change it? And so what we did, I th there's a little dispute about whether we actually did this. So this may just be a story. Actually, let's just say, this is just a story. Suspend, suspend uh, judgment. But if you turn that drawing into a black and white drawing, you can't tell that it's vegetated roofs and photovoltaic panels. You can just sort of see it's a fuzzy looking <laughs> roof for some reason, right? But our, we got pushback from our client. This is the punchline. We got pushback. We thought we'd solved the world's problems, and this is going to be great. They said, you know, we're in a silo. Excuse me, sir, we're in a silo. We're TOD, and that's somebody else's silo. You're, let, let, you're coloring outside the lines. We don't care to have that. And so that's essentially what it is looking at. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't fatal, but it was pronounced. And, I, and the person that had that reaction at the time remembers it differently now, which is why I will Let's, you know, the, in the TV shows, they do that sort of thing where you're suddenly going into a dream sequence. That's what we just did, and then we just came out of it. So, I, the gentleman's name is Bill, lovely man. We remember it differently. I was on the experiencing it, kind of like Janice, who's the driver. Yeah, she picked me up on an ex expressway. I, I wouldn't remember. Um, by the way, so 46th and Hiawatha, TOD up in Minneapolis, and we've got density going uh, big time, and um, we're trying to convince the neighbors that this is a good idea to put a transit village right at one of their, their train stops. And they oppose density, you know, strap themselves to trees to stop this project. It was that sort of aggressive. But at the end, after four meetings, we had a four-story mixed-use town center. And I just said, and this is the year 2000, I think, yeah, if the buildings were green, could they be one story taller? And all the hands in the room go up. Now this is, you know, 2000. Lead, I didn't explain lead, I didn't say what I meant by a green building, just the word green building. And they gave us another story. Now if you're a developer and you're trying to make a profit, you're trying to get more development going, that's a huge windfall. And all I had to do was to ask, use the word green. So I was like, oh my God, maybe when you apply green building at the scale of the urban, there's actually some value there, 
right? Maybe there's somebody would see, you know, value. So, uh, you know, uh, things were launched. So, meanwhile, we're starting to build things, and we're starting at the core that we can figure out, which honestly was sort of stormwater. So, there was a movement called conservation subdivisions. You may or may not remember. There's still a few of them out there, and so. But they tended to be subdivisions, true subdivisions, where they at very low densities, like half acre lots, one acre lots, and so on, where they would do a good job at stormwater. Well, hint, it's really hard not to do a good job at stormwater at half acre lots, right? Unless the house is also a half acre, then you have an issue. But you know, put a, even a McMansion on a half acre lot, and there's like 60% open space, you don't have a stormwater problem. So it was a perversion to me that these were suddenly conservation subdivision, like exactly what aspect of the world are you conserving in a <laughs> conservation subdivision, not clear to me. So what interested us was not the low density end, but the urban end, the higher density stuff. So how could we do that? So this is a, a project of kind of an unflattering picture, but the one I, I had in coming here. Um, so this is down in Miller Beach, Indiana, uh, just over the Chicago-Indiana border, or Illinois-Indiana border. And what we figured out how to do in this is there's four blocks and a kind of ball field sort of at the center and a midway kind of goes, you know, right to the center there. There are a total of four pipes for stormwater purposes in this entire project. And if I had a pointer, I would show you, but the midway there, there's one pipe to five, excuse me, one, two, three, four, that ducks under the street, and then a fifth one that ducks under the street that bisects the midway. So we figured out how to just surface flow all the water off this. And the developer, our client was McCormick Baron, and they show up with a pro forma from their prior project, and they say, your project's going to pencil out kind of like this. You know, we'll adjust it for local, you know, labor rates and, and, you know, do building materials cost more or less, but they gave us the spreadsheet. And then we got to the line item called civil engineering, and we had done this, and they got the price back, said, you know, there's something wrong. You know, your, your number on, on uh, civil is really low. I think they missed something. So, well, you know, and then they looked at the drawings and said, Doug, you got no pipes. Like, you know, your price is too low. You know, something this is like alarming to them. And then it's like alarm turned to delight. Like, what do you mean there's only five pipes? So, wow, you can do that? Yeah, yeah. So it was a winner, right? We actually saved the money and did a better job. Here's the midway. It's a little, I look back and I think it's a little too wide. We kind of gave it too much space. The buildings aren't tall enough really to command that space. But here, in each of those four blocks, we did a rain garden. Kind of, you saw it first at Chicago Center. Here it is now being applied at the block scale. There it was obscured by shrubbery. Here it is summer and winter. It's just kind of a gap between houses, and it's about you know, 20, 20, 25 feet wide. Uh, and it is large enough to do the stormwater work we needed done for an entire block. And then there's one pipe that connects it to the midway, and, and so on and so on. So, kind of successful. So that was, you know, 2003 we built that. Now, okay, so that was first early applications of green building ideas at the scale of the development. Now we're back advancing green buildings because we just honestly just did CCGT. We threw everything we'd ever heard of in the project and it mostly worked, mostly worked. You know, I, the other thing I think is, it's hard to talk about, but it's important. You know, in the few years we've been doing this, you know, we, we still like to take risks with our clients' consent and knowledge, not sort of slipping things off. But Chicago Center, there were a few things that didn't work out that well. They really didn't, you know? We were urged to sort of try things, we were willing to be pioneers. And so I think that's also part of the story, is an honest accounting of what was good and what wasn't. So here was our sketch for the Bethel Commercial Center, which was in the one of the TOD sketches I showed you a while ago, and you can see uh, green roof, photovoltaic, uh, light shelves, awnings, uh, da da da, zero law and building. Here's the way it turned out. Not you know, not too far off. Um, so there's the green roof, uh, keep building integrated photovoltaics there, uh, light shelves, and so on. It happens to be one of seven buildings in Chicago attached directly to a CTA platform. The two airports, um, Marshall Field, Merchandise Mart. There's one other and this. So it's you know, rare rare company indeed. We're trying daylighting in a multi-story building. Where have we seen that before? We tried that at the Elks, you know, uh, you know, some years earlier, trying to bounce light down and inside, and that was an interesting uh, deal. Here's the roof. So, photovoltaics, cornice, green roof, more building, just building out of photovoltaics. Uh, the daylight, the skylights, daylight louvers, etc., etc. So you're getting a feel for it. So here it is. 
coming down into the space. This is the, we made a, a shaft through the second floor that we lined with foil, you see here on the lower left. On the top, it's got that egg crate mover, so we're not getting the heat, but we are getting the light. And then I showed it this way, there's a diffusing panel that comes on. And so what's cool about all this shenanigans is that on the ground floor of a very deep building, it's like 80 feet deep with only light on one side, you can do your business all day long with the lights off. That's the punchline. And it's bright enough to read, write, transact, etc. So it's really, really cool. It works. These are the oldest ideas ever, is like, you know, light shafts and light shelves. Chrissy Weber Landscapes, our, one of our next uh, platinum buildings, was built next to the Chicago Center by a private sector uh, client who said, I like CCG to be good. All that stuff that was expensive and didn't work, don't show it to me. Just distill for me the stuff that worked. And so what we ended up with was this building, which was um, the city's second intensive green roof. Extensive is you know, uh, thin, extensive is deep. And so there's you know, trees on the roof, et cetera, et cetera. The things that we thought worked, geothermal, displacement, ventilation, uh, and so on, and a building that resulted in 60% energy savings. So this was great. This is a private sector building. Light shelves, light bouncing, uh, exposed structure, uh, displacement ventilation, so there's a you know, raised floor underneath it. Um, again, taking, taking risks, taking chances. We talked, I talked the client in landscaping firm to putting a green roof, excuse me, a green house on the roof. And in the meeting, she said, now why are we putting the greenhouse on the roof again? I said, well, I think it'll be a great party space, and you can grow things. And I think it's a trend. You saw this from you know, the, one of those early projects of putting a garden on a roof. Like, I think this is going to be a big trend in cities, that people will want to grow food on their roofs. Grow food on their roofs, that's so completely crazy. But she built it. So, but we tried really hard to integrate systems, which you know, in the green building movement, we are trained to do, that you don't want to do the perfect MEP with a terrible envelope and so on. So in this case, what we figured out to do was the intake for the entire, the fresh air intake for the entire building, we put it in the greenhouse. And so in the wintertime, what's cool about that is it's the greenhouse is a natural preheat for the intake air. So rather than being zero degrees, it's you know, actually 60, 70, 80, even on a cold winter day. What we didn't see coming, which seems sort of obvious when you see this picture, is that there would be aromas coming with the fresh air. So, uh, and it happened one day by, quite by accident. Somebody had moved, it was a mint or oregano, I can't remember, up into the greenhouse. And we were standing down there and, you smell something? You know, yeah, I do, you know, what is it? And so it was the mint or oregano, I can't remember now, that had just been moved into the greenhouse, freshly cut, and it filled the building. And so that was kind of cool, like you could have aroma days, you know, you could have mint, mint Tuesdays and, you know, whatever. Um, which was really, really cool. So I don't know, this is an experiment. It's been built once and you know, not much promoted, but there's something there. There's something that links humans to plants in the idea that your air might be scented with plants growing up on the roof. There's something cool about that. And uh, also it does save energies. So we work really hard to try and express, try and express how water gets off a roof. Uh, this may seem just trivial, but I think it's important that um, the worst thing is what often happens, which is it rains, the water disappears, and you go outside and say, I can't see water flowing or falling or anything of the sort. Like, I guess I'll just stay indoors and watch TV, right? I want people to say, it's so cool, it's raining. Let's go outside and watch you know, the puddles or the splashes of the river or whatever it is. So these three-sided uh, downspouts are, are one of our kind of elements we sort of come back to a lot. The city of Chicago's first pervious paver street. So this is a street that filters its own rainwater. So there's, again, there are no discharge pipes off this site. So we're applying what we first learned in a very small scale now to an entire city street, so infrastructure. Um, and it you know, penciled out, OK, once you do large runs of it, what kills you is little onesies and twosies. We say, you know, I'm doing an acre of it or a couple acres. The, the price drops quite a lot. You could, there's mechanical uh, you know, gas powered placement of these things. The other sort of technological innovation that we did on this project, which has nothing to do with the picture that that little you know, inset dropped on, is that it was our first use of uh, fabric ductwork. So rather than sheet metal, uh, it's, it's fabric. And so when it's not, when the air is not circulating, the fans are off, it falls and is kind of limp. And you, it hangs on sort of uh, supports, and it sort of sags between the supports. The fans come on, 
the thing gets the term, the mechanical term is turgid. Don't get any ideas, turgid. And, um, and so it fills up. And so it's sort of, it's, it's animated. It's sort of a building a bit breathing, right? It comes to life a little bit. What's cool is you unsnap these things, you throw them in the washer, you clean your guts, right? And so it's really cool. So, and this is also a fraction of the cost of sheet metal. So if you're a sheet metal contractor or in the metals import business, bad news, right? The good news is mostly the codes protect the need for this not to be fabric and that it must be sheet metal. And it's not clear to me honestly why, right? It's, you know, there might be some small risk of flame here, but that would be about it. You know, I think sheet metal is frankly overkill. So we have a lot of codes fights that we do. I would say, I feel, feel to say in all of our green buildings, we have between two and I think it's four uh, illegalities where the thing we're trying to do is not allowed in code and we are willing to stand our ground and fight. And so we have a lot of, you know, arrow holes in our backs so for that. Um, here's trying to use solar hot water systems, was this 2004, um, as a kind of cornice element. It didn't quite work. It, was, it had to set back too far. They wanted a worker person to be able to get to walk all four sides of them. I wanted it snug to the back of the cornice. Uh, but we're, try, you know, we're trying stuff, expressing things like, you know, that must be a building with solar energy on it for that reason. Um, we were hired to work on a house here in Alice Beach, which was a DPZ master plan project down in the Panhandle of Florida. And DPZ has just made developers, you know, millions and millions of dollars through these sort of styled, branded communities. This particular one was branded off Bermuda, which I've never been to, but it's white, and, uh, kind of the, the steppy uh, uh, chimneys and so on that you see their stepped roofs and so on. So we. The house we did, which seamlessly integrates in the ones around it, is the one with the blue shutters. I'll show you the inside here. So, um, you know, one of the assignments we gave ourselves was to make the courtyard interesting and do something with the water in it. So, all we could, given everything, all we could do was this, except that we put a porous bottom on the courtyard and there's geothermal under the courtyard. So, all the, all the buildings in this phase of construction were geothermal. We were the green consultant there. The other thing is, if you've been to a traditional Mexican courtyard house, uh, the courtyard is the brightest, and then you go in one layer, it's a little darker, and then you get to the deep back ends of the rooms, and they're completely pitch dark, and you can't see anything. So our uh, sort of challenge and innovation that we did was to introduce clerestory lighting along those darkest edges. And so it's, it's a counterintuitive courtyard house. It's really bright in the courtyard, and then really bright, again, at the deepest point. So it was, it was pretty fun, and we did that in a way that um, didn't admit heat, but did admit light. I love stuff like this. This is a rooftop summer kitchen, right? So just imagine, you don't cook when it's hot out. You're not in that kitchen with the AC running bright. You're just on the roof. There's a sink, fridge, stove, you know, and you could be, this could be margaritas and limes. This could be whatever it is you want, you know? But anyway, I love rooftop living. Um, but the aesthetics of the place were such that we wanted to do renewable energy systems, PVs in this case and the design guidelines prevented them. The values of the place were not our values, which is, we're all about expressing things. They were about suppressing this. Like, hmm, you wanna do photovoltaics? Well, if you can completely hide them, maybe, right? So that's what we did here. So it's on the roof. It can't even be seen by the neighbors from their second floors, right? You'd have to be in a plane or on a crane to see this thing. So then it was acceptable, but the parapets all sort of gently you know, screen it. So uh, anyway, just I mentioned that only to say that you know, going forward with the kind of we need to show what we're about sort of thing, express how the systems work was not universally supported. So, and maybe, maybe they were right. Maybe in this case there was a higher sort of calling. So okay, having done all that for a while, more and more integration of urban scale things into buildings and building scale things into urban uh, we think we're now confident. We're going to call it something called sustainable urbanism, and we wrote a book which is available, you know, on Amazon, and you know, there's copies floating around the building here somewhere. But this was really an attempt to say we can't be the only ones. I mean, somebody else out there has got to be doing this, and in fact, we're really unlikely to be the only ones. We're small in one corner of the world, um, so we cast an ad. We found, you know, 200 people submitted case studies. We called them down to 20. Um, like Christopher Alexander's book, The Pattern Language, are people familiar with that? We were really hot on this idea, and I'm not going to talk about it today, that were there patterns in this 
sustainable urbanism, of applying sort of green building principles at the scale of a neighborhood or a town, were there patterns that were discernible that you could publish that others could learn, right? So you didn't have to show up and say, I don't know how to do this. Like, so we did that. So there's 20 or so uh, called emerging patterns of sustainable urbanism. Things like, um, you know, how many, uh, how much of an, if you're doing stormwater in a neighborhood, how much of the land area does that take? What's the number? Oh, percent, more or less, is the answer. Um, if I were doing waste treatment for a community of 500 or 1,000 or 5,000, how big is the, if I'm doing it in a natural way, the greenhouse that grows it and then the field that would do, treat the gray water? Uh, you know, this, there's a chart. It's now a lookup chart. So if I'm doing a plan, I want to do naturalized wastewater, and I want to know how much land does that take? Stuff like that. You know, how many, what kind of land use configuration and density do you need to support a share car? Look it up. You know, what's the walk? What? How many houses do you need to support a walk? A walk to park, and what real estate premium does it give you back at what distance? It's all in there. So really cool. Anyway, um, and a, a first go around. How are we doing on time? You can go five minutes. Then I'm going to go really fast. I'm just going to skip through a lot of stuff. Um, and in fact, maybe I'll just sort of do this in one other. So. Remember back in 1999, we did that drawing of, uh, for normal Illinois. So here it is built. This is um, 20, pictures from 2010 or 20, yeah, 2011. Actually, this picture is from this year. I'm sorry, why am I so confused? So uh, if you remember, the, it was one of our early kind of aha sustainable urbanist pictures of integrating green buildings, infrastructure, and placemaking, right? And so I include this one because I just, I think it got so much so right. So, so there's a circle, uh, a circular, uh, you know, five-way intersection that comes into a circular thing, right? The story I haven't told you about that is that that was a really dopey idea in the eyes of traffic engineers. Why? They view the center of what they would call an urban roundabout, that's the name they give it, the one-lane urban roundabout. They view that as, it's, I think it's called the free zone, maybe, maybe the engineers can correct me. It is space in their minds allocated to the driver of a vehicle who uh, has a seizure, falls asleep uh, while operating the vehicle, and then the vehicle wants to go straight into the circle, right? And so it's, it's not, the, the free zone is not for the benefit of the kids and the strollers and the bicyclists that the car might hit. It is there for the benefit of the driver to adequately recover without causing property damage to their car. So, are we in a silo for a moment here? Yes, we are, right? So this is a pose, the idea that humans, you know, let alone kids and strollers and so on, could be at the center of a traffic circle was explicitly against engineering guidance. And so from 2002 to four or four to six, I've, my, my years have gone on, we had a two-year battle with U.S. Department of Transportation about whether people could occupy the center of this circle. We kept getting, well, the driver could lose control and they need time to recover and all sorts of stuff. So we were losing this battle. And then it was a really clever engineer said, you know, why don't we just call it a circular intersection? And what was beautiful about that is there is no such thing as a circular <laughs> intersection. And so the engineer would reach to their shelf and look for the guidance on circular intersection and couldn't find it. And so, you know, engineers you know, there's this idea that engineers design things, and then there's another model that engineers use cookbooks, right? So this is, if you're a cookbook engineer and say, well, if it's in the book, I can do it, that's, you know, that, and that limits a lot of the things we'd like to do. If you're an actual engineer, an engineer, which is say, I go observe, I learn from reality, I apply lessons and principles, boom, boom, boom. So the minute it was a circular intersection, the engineers that might have been tempted to cookbook couldn't do it. There wasn't a book. Right? So they now had to apply their own professional judgment. So, well, now that it's not a one-lane urban roundabout, it's a circular intersection, Jesus, there's only 5,000 cars a day, and honestly, you'd be crazy to go more than about 15 miles an hour going into this thing, because the streets are only two blocks long anyway, and you got all these, you know, bump outs and speed table, like, you know, you know nobody's going to get hurt in that. Same guys, you know. <laughs> Didn't, the physical design did not change. The name changed, right? And so this is U.S. Department of Transportation, hold, hold that story. So um, several other things. All the buildings around the circle, LEED certified. And it was the first, Normal was the first municipality in the United States in 2002 to mandate LEED buildings in private development. So that was 10 years ago. So they were ahead of, you know, Portland, 
Portland, Seattle, New York, Chicago, you know, all the Austin, Boulder, normal. Normal Illinois, beat them. Uh, you know, define the new normal, right? The other thing is that here's the, the circle, the, uh, and I think I have another picture of it, but those storm water is exactly what we said. Let's catch the water off the streets and filter it to where it's, you know, delight, for, for human delight. Couldn't the driver drown in that? <laughs> I think they could. If the car felt, okay, you know, you ever listen to Garrison Keillor has this episode called Worst Case Scenario? You know, you're walking down the street and there's an earthquake, yeah, and a 747 crashes on you, yeah, and then, you know, and then you have a heart attack, yeah, and then it's like, oh, but that's only half of it, you know, it gets worse, right? All the things that can happen at one time, so potentially the driver could drown, right? Um, so to make this drum-shaped place, we had we our associates had to figure out form-based coding. So we now do that, you know, around the country. Um, you know, so there there are kind of professional benefits to being you know innovators, where you have to figure stuff out, and then people mistake you for an expert um, and and hire you repeatedly to do that. So here's that circle, um, and you can see there's a there's actually a double helix. So the outer uh, path that water takes around the outside is filled with uh, native plants that actually you know knock the solids and the oils out of them and cleanse the water and then the second pass is to be touchable so uh, it's really lovely it was designed by Peter Lindsay Shout um, a landscape architect of the first order and just you know deserves all the praise uh, he wants so here's the kids you know uh, if thank God it's not a one lane urban roundabout because they would be in the free zone and be at risk of a driver having just had a seizure trying to recover and not get a dent in their fender fortunately it's a circular intersection and humans are allowed there and are actually having a hell of a good time while mom watches you know uh, Jane and Joey get wet bottoms I mean that's really what's going on here and what is the water there what is the what is the standard to which the water they're playing in has been cleaned it's not potable, it's not swimmable. What is it? This is water, it's been taken off the streets. We all played in puddles as kids, right? Splash the puddles. That was that water. What was that water rated to? Municipal official, lawyer with a big yellow marker, you know, threat of stays, blah, blah, blah. What water, what standard was this water treated to? I have no effing idea, honestly. We searched for like, what is there a standard for this? And there isn't. So we're just out there with water that's been responsibly cleansed on the belief that people know that in the public arena, you know, you just saw a dog get out of that fountain. Please don't drink it. You know, uh, it probably would not make you sick, but it's in a gray area. And so I think a lot of interesting things are in gray areas. So um, I'm just a couple slides from the back, Janice. So don't panic. So I'm fine. I'm told I'm fine. Thank you so much. So, but here you know you've got it going, which is you know the one one of the cool things that's you know that Michigan is a leader in these days, and you may not know this is the uh, I forget what the program is called, but it is a place-based uh, approach to economic development that says we don't we are not a state, we are a state of places, and so cities uh, and the redevelopment from core cities is really um, you know Michigan's policy, and Michigan and others are implementing. It's really cool. And what's wise about that is that you know the twenty-somethings, many of whom are in the audience, who will be the you know the Bill Gates and the so-and-sos of their their next generation, Mark, um, whatever that Facebook guy is, Mark Zuckerberg. Um, you know the people that make the new economy, that invent the new products, that write the new code. You know are mobile, and they can go to a coast, or they can go to New York, or they can go to Chicago, or they can go wherever. Um, and if you can retain them in your town through something cool your economy benefits. And so this happened one day, and these are, you know, uh, there's a college down the road, so these are college kids, but they are hanging out in downtown Normal, which would never have ever, ever, ever happened. I don't know that this is gonna, you know, uh, make, retain the really smart computer programming graduate from Illinois State University and prevent them from going to Palo Alto. I don't know that, but it's gotta help. So it's, you know, it's a really, and it's a really cool story. So. This place won uh, the Uptown Normal Plan from 1999, won the 2011, you know, it takes, takes years to do places, right? You know, a building you can do in one or two or three years. Places take 10, 15, 20 years, so thank God we're all young people. But won this, uh, you know, uh, National Smart Growth Award for the best new civic space in America, which we were, again, very proud of. And, but this, is, this gets even better. It also won this project prize from the Federal Highway Administration, FTA. The people that fought us tooth and nail for two years gave us their highest design award. 
And what was the time lag between the end of the fight and the award? Eight years. And so I have peppered through this comment lots of areas where we're against a code or we're in a gray area of practice, those sorts of things. And these sorting out regulations and so on takes 10 and 15 and 20 years, I'm sorry to say, but we've been at it a long time, that takes that long. And so, um, you know, honestly, a lot of the things in the country, the rules insist on the wrong thing still, when we all in this room know better, just rules just lag. And so, um, you know, part of our practice is at some point we sort of hit ourselves in the head like, why do we keep coming up against bad rules? Let's just start writing good rules. And so we are one of, you know, five or six firms in the country that's you know, at, at the top of the list for form-based codes. We can now make a place that is predictably walkable as opposed to reliably driving. You know? So we know how to do that. We get consulted by big cities on how do we green our building code, things like that. So anyway, there's, there's opportunities in being a nut. So I want to show one last slide that's going to cause me to skip ahead. So you're missing all sorts of great things, but that's OK. Um, yeah. Oh.